Hello, good morning everyone. Uh, we are going to start our webinar now. This is uh, Richard speaking. So as you can see, uh, we've got a packed content today. So uh, we shall jump right into it right now. So first thing, uh, I'll talk about our industrial REITs sector report, which we published today. Uh, the title of the report is Tailwind of Tapering New Supply This Year. These are the highlights. Uh, we are maintaining our equal weight view on industrial REITs subsector. Uh, based on JTC data uh, for fourth quarter 2017, uh, sector occupancy has ticked up quarter on quarter. This was driven by take up of newly completed warehouse space. However, sector occupancy was lower year on year nonetheless. Uh, this reflects uh, the oversupply situation where occupancy uh, is creeping down. Rental index across the board has yet to bottom, uh, but business park rental has made new high. And the tapering of new supply in 2018 leads us to believe that rents to bottom by the end of this year. So this is the summary for the data released by JTC. In the top half of the table is for the rental, uh, that's for industrial and then all the individual property types, then this occupancy for the aggregate and then this is for the individual property types. So just a quick glance you can see that uh, most of the arrows are red and pointing down. Uh, one to highlight is a business park, you can see rental uh, quarter on quarter and year on year has been higher and likewise for business park occupancy uh, quarter on quarter and year on year uh, has been higher also. As I mentioned uh, in the first slide, uh, industrial occupancy is higher quarter on quarter. You can see right here. Uh, that was uh, led by the uptick in occupancy for warehouse, which you can see here, 1.6% quarter on quarter. Sorry, not 1.6%, uh, 1.6 percentage point. So these are key highlights. Uh, key takeaways from the quarter, uh, what we get from speaking to the read managers as well as uh, the announcements that get uploaded onto the SGX website. So first thing, from our conversations with the managers, they are roughly unchanged in what they are saying in the last few quarters. They are saying that they do see more inquiries. Uh, but it still takes time to convert to an actual signing and it's still a tenant's market. However, in this quarter, what we hear uh, managers start to talk about also is that they're getting selective on tenants where uh, we hear them mentioning the term uh, credit quality. So they are also emphasizing uh, strength in their tenant's uh, ability to pay their rent. Some REITs have also expanded their investment mandates such as um, Maple Tree Industrial and Soybean REIT. So for Maple Tree Industrial, they expanded their investment mandate to include data centers outside of Singapore, uh, but this will be capped at, uh, at a limit of 20% of their total portfolio. So the exposure to overseas will uh, only be 20% and the REIT is still 80% focused on uh, Singapore. For soybean REIT, it has uh, expanded its investment mandate to include Australia as well. And next is uh, ESR REIT has proposed a merger with uh, Viva, Viva to acquire the REIT. So ESR will acquire Viva by issuing new ESR units to the existing uh, Viva unit holders. For the outlook wise, uh, negative reversions are expected to persist in 2018 and managers expect rent to bottom in 2018. Through our conversations we're speaking with the REIT managers, uh, some of them are, they are, they are of a varying degrees of optimism. Uh, some of them think that rent to bottom in the first half of this year. Some expect 
to bottom in the second half of this year. But I think the general, I think everyone is in agreement that the rents should bottom this year. Also for the REITs that announced their full year results for December, uh, all six of them recorded some revaluation losses. So that's cash, ESR REIT, Capital DC REIT, Sabana, Soybuilt and Viva. So for investment actions, we still maintain equal weight view on the industrial REIT subsector. So the highlight, what we highlight is the tailwind and headwinds. So tailwind is the tapering of supply in 2018. Uh, headwinds would be the negative rental reversions to continue into 2018. So this is significant for the REITs where they have a large amount of renewals happening this year. That's uh, what you should take note of or yeah, or REITs where they have a major property that will be uh, having the master lease expiring. So Outlook, uh, I've said it quite a few times already, we expect rents to bottom by the end of this year uh, and we would like to see a broad based improvement in occupancy in order to upgrade our sector view for the industrial REITs. So what I mean by broad based improvement in occupancy is to see all the various property types uh, increase, improving their occupancy and not just one uh, one property type that is uh, leading the overall higher. So we currently have four industrial REITs under our coverage. We dropped coverage of soybean REIT uh, in the recent quarter. We now have uh, two accumulate and two neutral. Uh, ascenders and cash we still have accumulate and capital DC and Maple Tree Industrial are on neutral. So top-down view is same as uh, last few quarters. We are saying maintain exposure to business and science park properties and high-tech high-specs buildings. Uh, this is in line with uh, the Smart Nation initiative where we are going towards higher value-added manufacturing. And then so you should get exposure to uh, REITs with uh, such properties within their portfolio. And so we have seen that business and science park rents uh, had ticked up already and we expect them to maintain, uh, main, be maintained. Uh, this underpinned by limited new supply of such uh, properties. So now we'll go into some uh, key points of the REITs under our coverage. These are the takeaways from the recent quarter's uh, results. First is a Sanders REIT. So the portfolio occupancy remains high and there's a healthy whale of 4.2 years. A large proportion of its uh, net property income, that's uh, almost 60% of it, comes from business park and high specs properties in Singapore. So uh, this is also beneficial to them as I was talking about the Smart Nation push for higher value added manufacturing as well as the limited new supply. And for the remaining quarter for their financial year that ends in March, uh, they have 5.1% of NLA in Singapore that's up for renewal. Uh, but this should be buffered by contributions from their recent acquisitions. So there should be minimal impact from this. For cash logistics, uh, we upgraded it from neutral to accumulate in the recent quarter. Uh, on the basis that they have recapitalized their balance sheet uh, through that uh, rights issue. So after their results, they had announced that they'll be acquiring a portfolio of nine logistic properties in Australia and this will be funded by a combination of debt and perpetual securities. So because there's no equity involved, uh, their gearing has uh, remained almost the same uh, and we estimate that their gearing will be about just below 36% after the acquisition of those nine properties and also the divestment of 40 Alps Avenue. So this uh, divestment of 40 Alps Avenue has been announced and uh, is in progress. So the manager has said that divestment proceeds will be used to repay that um, The 
key downside risk is uh, the master list expiry of CWD commodity hub this year. Uh, it takes about 26% by portfolio value of uh, cash, but this has been partially mitigated uh, with pre-commitment of about two-thirds of the NLA from the existing tenants. For Maple Tree Industrial, uh, they had their joint venture of 14 data centers and that has contributed uh, uh, some number of days for the results. It's not a full quarter, uh, but it started contribution ready. And this increases its uh, income exposure to this uh, niche asset type and also diversifies uh, its income stream outside of Singapore. Some ongoing projects is the Kalang AEI and the data center built to suit. So these two will be coming on stream in 2018 and should contribute positively. Uh, the Kalang AEI is currently 12% pre-committed. That's an improvement over the last quarter, which was only 3% pre-committed. Uh, there's no tenant risk for the data center as it's a built to suit. So there will be one uh, tenant who will take the whole data center. In the results report that we had published uh, some weeks ago, uh, we had also mentioned that valuation is uncompelling and, and implied 1.48 times. So take note that this uh, is based on the price back then when the report was published and, and not the most recent price. For Kappa DC Read, uh, they had acquired a data center that's Kappa DC Dublin 2. Uh, so that should contribute in 2018 for full year since it was acquired in September last year. And also their ongoing uh, built to suit main cubes data center in Germany uh, should come online in the second quarter of this year. So these two will contribute positively for their revenue in 2018. The manager is also working towards achieving its uh, 2 billion AUM target this year. Same as the previous slide, uh, we also, this uh, last bullet point uh, is as at the date that we had published the report uh, where we had said that valuation appears to be rich uh, at an implied 1.45 times book. Uh, just I'll just run through the next few slides quickly. So this is uh, on the left you see occupancy, on the right is a rental. This is for the aggregate, uh, this is the JTC data for the aggregate industrial sector. So you can see uh, occupancy has ticked up quarter on quarter but it's still lower year on year. And uh, the rent index uh, has yet to find a bottom as well. For factory occupancy seems to have stabilized while rent uh, is still making new lows uh, and hasn't found a bottom yet. Business park is the only bright spark among the property types. So on the left you see occupancy is better quarter on quarter and year on year. Likewise for rental, uh, it's better quarter on quarter and year on year as well. Warehouse, uh, there was a tick up in occupancy quarter on quarter, but it's still lower year on year. And on the right, you'll see that rental index uh, is still sliding and hasn't found a bottom yet. Here, the chart on the right uh, shows the upcoming uh, supply pipeline in 2018 and beyond, so 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. You can see that uh, it's already tapering off since 2018. Uh, by property type, factory still remains the highest supply, and you see that business park-wise, uh, there's a limited new supply. So for 2018, there's about 1.6 million square meters of space expected to come on stream. Uh, this potentially increases the current stock of industrial space by about 3.4%. To put this uh, 1.6 million square meters into context, this uh, 1.6 million square meters of new supply 
is uh, still lower than the historical last three years, uh, 1.8 million. However, it's uh, higher than the annual demand of 1.3. So what this table here shows is the in terms of percentage increase in uh, the supply over existing stock. Uh, you can see that overall supply is tapering off in 2018 and there's limited new supply particularly for business parks. So in 2017 um, overall growth in new supply or overall uh, available space grew in grew 4.2% and in 2018 is expected to grow by 3.4%. So you can see that the growth is tapering off in terms of new supply adding to existing stock. So this is uh, showing the P the charts here are showing the PMI on the left and industrial production on the right. So our view for 2018 is industrial production expected to moderate due to base effect. Uh, 2017 there was a tremendous growth in industrial production. In fact, in the last quarter of uh, 2017, you can see it started to moderate down already. Uh, especially in December 2017, which is this point here, you can see it went into uh, negative year-on-year -year growth already. But take note that uh, for the corresponding December 2016, it's actually this point here where the growth was uh, really high at about 22% uh, year-on-year. So this is, uh, this is showing the base effect where uh, growth rate is expected to moderate. We also expect rents to stabilize in 2018, but will still remain competitive. Uh, that's because while um, new supply is less than the historical supply, but uh, it's still more than historical demand. And we need to see uh, industrialists uh, soak up the excess space that has been carried over from the oversupply in the last two years. This table is just a quick snapshot of the results this quarter for the various industrial REITs and some of the commentary on uh, reasons for uh, their directional uh, behavior. This is uh, for the full year results. Uh, you can take a look at them in detail in the report. This chart, is, uh, as usual, is showing the performance measures for the various REITs such as occupancy, whale, gearing, weighted average debt maturity, and weighted average cost of debt, and their interest coverage. This slide shows the trend of a uh, compressing yields and rising va valuations. So this is the most current uh, slide where it's based on 9 February and each of these numbers here are going back uh, in the previous quarter when we present uh, our sector view. So you can see uh, right from a year ago, uh, trailing U was about 7.9 and it has compressed along the way to now uh, 6.9 as of last Friday and price to book was about 1.02 times the average price to book 1.02 uh, a year ago and is now 1.13 times. Here the chart is showing uh, the trailing yield on the left axis and bottom axis is the price to book and so as usual, the larger capitalized REITs are at the bottom right corner of the chart, which uh, implies that investors are uh, paying more than book value and are willing to accept uh, a lower yield for these uh, larger cap REITs. So it's no change from previous quarter. You can see that these same uh, larger cap industrial REITs are at the bottom right corner as well. 
some things to note is that uh, compared to a quarter ago, seems like uh, ESR read has re-rated from uh, less than 0.9 times book to now just below one time book. And conversely, Viva was uh, more than 1.2 times book and is now over here uh, just below 1.2 times book. Now we move on to the results for 800 Super Holdings where they announced their results last Friday and we published a report this morning. Uh, we maintain accumulate uh, target price uh, 135 slightly lower than the previous 140. We have also trim our full year dividend estimate to 3 cents. That's because uh, they did not declare an uh, interim dividend for this first half. The last close price was uh, 114. So you can see revenue was down 8.3%. This was due to completion of term contracts and renew of certain contracts at more competitive prices. Uh, in terms of operating profit, uh, while the operating expenses was lower, uh, but it did not was not able to offset the decline in revenue. So uh, EBIT was down 31% year on year and a margin also was lower year on year. Consequently, pet me also lower about 32% year on year. So first for the top line revenue, we had expected a year on year lower revenue of only about a negative three. So this a negative eight is a much lower than we had expected. And from the EBIT line, you can see that uh, seems like contract cleaning business is a uh, facing pressure with uh, competition and margin is being compressed. The projects are on track and turning operational this year. That's the waste to energy plant, which will be the first quarter of this year and the sludge treatment facility second quarter of this year. Uh, I mentioned already the negative surprise of absence of interim dividend. So first half of this FY, uh, there was a negative free cash flow and also, we this is due to the capex for the construction of the waste to energy plant and sludge treatment facility. But these two projects should contribute uh, positively once they reach their normalized uh, operating level. We also think that uh, one of the reasons for the absence of the interim dividend is to conserve cash for the capex requirements associated with that uh, public waste collection contract which they recently were awarded for the pastries Bedok sector. We have lowered our current year and next year's uh, dividend assumption uh, to three cents in view of all these uh, capex requirements and three cents is the same level as FY17. Our outlook for 800 Super is a uh, stable to positive. Uh, the new projects when turning, when they have turned uh, operational and reached their normalized uh, utilization should drive earnings growth from FY19 onwards. Next is the results for Namli Pressed Metal. Uh, they also announced their results last Friday and we published the report this morning. They reported their first quarter and it's a strong start to the year and we still view it as a deep value you play. So we maintain buy, uh, target price of 56 cents, that's unchanged. Um, dividend per share, we are forecasting 2.5 cents, that's uh, no change in our forecast as well since our last report. And that will give you a 6.6% yield or over the last close price of 38 cents on Friday. So first thing, revenue, you can see it has increased almost 30% year on year. Uh, that was attributable to their aluminium segment. Uh, gross profit was higher, almost 40% year on year. Uh, and gross margin also was higher year on year due to the higher margin aluminium segment. Right to the bottom line, uh, PADME was 26% uh, higher year on year. 
So the higher revenue uh, was driven by aluminium segment. This is uh, likely referring to their aluminium frames uh, for container refrigeration units. Uh, we have already highlighted in our previous report that there's an improved the demand outlook for this pro product. And um, one of the negatives from this is that uh, trade receivables was higher quarter on quarter as a result of these higher sales. And this has led to a lower cash balance. Uh, balance sheet is still clean with a cash hoard. Uh, is in a net cash position of 29 million and this represents 31% uh, of its market capitalization. The net current asset value which is uh, current assets minus total liabilities is uh, 38.9 cents per share and this suggests limited downside risk for, uh, for the stock. Our outlook for Namli is uh, stable to positive as well. Uh, the tone of the management commentary is uh, more upbeat than a year ago and uh, management says that the recovery in the US economy is driving the aluminum frames business. So they have re this was uh, mentioned in their fourth quarter 1-7 uh, results and this is starting to materialize in first quarter 2018 already. We will now hand over to Guangzhou who will talk about the Singapore coal. Hi, good morning, it's Guangzhou here. So next uh, we will talk about the uh, Singapore coal monthly update. So what happened in the past uh, one month? So in China, um, the big four power generators um, sent a petition to NDRC to urge the authority to uh, push some regulations on the coal market. One is to uh, guarantee the operate at full capacity before the uh, festive um, holiday and increase the coal imports. As of now, um, the coal market in China is confronting to a shortage of supply. And the next, uh, the other one is to um, claim down the coal prices and coordinate with uh, China Railway to cap the increases uh, in transportation charge. Uh, because of uh, supply short, um, the domestic coal prices are uh, went up uh, uh, in January uh, and recorded the increase for consecutive. Uh, six months since uh, July last year. So in Indonesia side, the authority, uh, the, the state government already completed uh, the amendments on contracts. So uh, as a result, um, the coal miners in Indonesia will commit a lump sum 13.5% uh, of royalties in cash. So in the past, uh, these coal miners can pay these uh, royalties in the form of a uh, coal deposit. But now they have to pay in the form of cash. And also the negative impact will be that the land rental will be increased from one, one US dollars per hectare to four dollars per hectare. So the next uh, is our coal trackers are uh, the six indicators that we monitor every month. So you can see the first chart here. The domestic production in China uh, actually uh, went down uh, since uh, June last year. So year on year growth was recorded at close to uh, 0% and meanwhile the coal import from Indonesia in um, over the last quarter dropped significantly. That e explains why the um, China side uh, was 
facing the shortage of supply. Uh, because uh, right now is the winter, uh, the seasonal demand came. So you can see here the domestic power generation, uh, the production uh, went up since uh, November. So this is the uh, HPA, the Indonesia Coal Price Reference, uh, continue to go up. Uh, so the next is, uh, as you can see here, the coal price in China continue to hover around um, at the at the red zone. So we believe that the authority will come up some uh, measures to clamp down the prices um, <coughs> moving forward. And also uh, the port coal inventory uh, declined uh, substantially in the last two months. So here are the updates on the two coal counters. So for uh, Golden Energy and Resources, um, we maintain our buy call with unchanged target price of 59 cents. And they announced that the 4Q results um, was very good. Um, as you can see here, the 4Q um, production arrived at 5.5 million tons. So as a result, the full year production tonnage reached uh, 15.6 million tons, which exceeded the annual target of 40 million tons. So uh, for this year, we expect that the total production will be more than 18 million tons. And for geo energy, uh, we maintain our buy call with unchanged target price of 44 cents. So uh, the latest update was uh, the company uh, successfully issued a 300 million US dollar senior note in uh, fourth quarter. Uh, so after um, repaying the MTN, which was worth uh, around a hundred million sing dollars and uh, advance payment from ECTP for last year's um, offtake agreements, the balance of uh, more than 200 million US dollars will be leveraged to uh, fund the M&As uh, this year. And also in December they secure another new offtake agreements uh, with ECTP. So at least this year, they will provide 7.5 million tons to uh, ECTP. Uh, next, I will pass on to Jeremy Jung to talk about Singapore banking sector. Hello, uh, good morning everybody. Um, okay, we'll go through the Singapore Banking Monthly and run through the key parameters. So the Singapore um, domestic business loans grew 6.2% uh, year on year, um, which was led by the real estate related business, uh, which grew 23%. So we see very strong um, real estate related uh, investments there. However, the um, Building and construction loans growth remains weak at uh, minus 0.8% year on year. The consumer loans growth in December was 4.8%, uh, uh, continuing the strong momentum we saw in November. So you can see in the um, green line here, it's trending upwards. And of course, the uh, mortgage um, mortgage loans are in that segment of consumer loans. So we expect um, strong performance from uh, the mortgage segment going to 2018. 
And the mortgage loans have kept pace with the 4% year-on-year growth and we sh- uh, should see that uh, move up slightly higher, probably close to 5% um, in 2018. Then the car loans growth again made a new high um, of 7.1% year-on-year in December. Um, over in Hong Kong, the property development and investments also led the growth. The outstanding value of the mortgage loans climbed uh, higher sequentially, increasing to 0.6% month-on-month, uh, up 7.8% year-on-year. Um, however, the according to JL, uh, Jones Lang LaSalle in Hong Kong, um, it was a, there was some weakness in January, so we see the volume and value down uh, month of month. But um, nonetheless, we still expect uh, um, a healthy year-on-year growth. <coughs> um, Jones Lang LaSalle also expects the secondary market uh, to be a bit more subdued in the wake of the extension of the buyer's stamp duty rebate window. Uh, extension from six months to 12 months. Uh, so this means is that the home upgraders in Hong Kong um, are, are given extra six months to quickly offload their existing property to upgrade to a new new one. So we would see probably some uh, supply increased supply coming in um, uh, from from these upgraders in the secondary market. While at the same time, of course, these upgraders will be looking at the new launches. Um, uh, to, to to upgrade their property, so uh, the the new the primary market would be in fact um, doing uh, well, expected to do well this year. <coughs> the cyber rates um, have surrendered all the December gains in January, so we see three month and one month cyber decline um, during this month. Um, but our channel checks reveal that the cyber packed mortgages uh, have not. Uh, increase. In fact, it has increased 20 to 30 basis points by the end of January compared to the beginning of January. Um, and what this means is that the new cyborg packed mortgages, those mortgages that have been uh, taken up in the month of January are not obviously in fact affected by the uh, uh, decline in cyborg. And on contrary, we would actually see better spreads on, on those uh, new mortgages. Um, but however, we given the inf- uh, inflation expectations are higher uh, after the strong February uh, reading of US non-farm payroll and hourly wages, we expect the cyborg to resume its upward trend uh, along with the Fed rate hike cycle. Lastly, we, uh, the offshore oil and gas operating con- uh, conditions um, con- uh, are, are stable. So we see the semi-submersible utilization have bottomed out and hovering at about 40%, uh, while the jackups utilization continues at a healthy 70%. Um, day rates clearly have bottomed out, um, and better day rates will be predicated on um, oil price hovering at about the US dollar $60 per barrel. Um, so we ha- ma- we continue to maintain uh, accumulate on the Singapore banking sector as all key parameters continue to look healthy. Um, okay. Okay, that's all. So we look, next we move over to the DB, uh, DBS Group Holdings um, for qu- fourth quarter results. It's a stellar performance across all its key parameters. And we can see that the net interest income growth grew um, very strongly at um, uh, 15%. Um, that is um, a marked improvement from what we saw in the second half of uh, 2016 and first half of 17, where net interest income uh, growth was struggling at the low single digit percent. And the strong performance it was uh, on the back of um, uh, widening names as well as uh, robust loans growth. Um, loans growth grew at 7%, while NIMS expanded at 7 basis points. Um, the wealth management and retail segment, um, the, the wealth management grew uh, strongly, right, uh, to up 26.5% year on year, but was 2.2% lower quarter on quarter because uh, fourth quarter is generally a, a weak quarter, so um, not too much of a concern there. The retail income growth was flat year on year, um, so it is. On, on that basis, it looks a bit sluggish, but that's because we had a very weak performance from the first quarter through to third quarter 17. And um, on the sequentially quarter on quarter, we see that it grew 5.7%. And that, to me, 
is uh, really turning around because in the retail income is mainly driven by the uh, mortgage loans. So uh, since the expectation of mortgage loans is, is um, rosy, uh, we're going to see um, stronger growth com uh, coming in and we expect the year-on-year uh, -year growth to, to look um, to, to be higher in 2018. The SME banking is a sweet spot. Um, it grew 16.2% year-on-year and 2.8% quarter-on-quarter on strong business expectations and strong PMI reading in Singapore, as well as the continued strength in the Chinese, uh, Chinese consumers' uh, sentiment. So both uh, what this means is that in Singapore and Hong Kong, this segment is going to grow strongly and it's also very sticky. So um, the pass-through of high interest rates would be quite effective. Um, the loans growth uh, is continued to keep pace at about 6 to 7% in 2018. Um, as for this year, we are seeing that the trade assets have also kind of um, rebound and the, uh, it has regained its um, size uh, of 50 billion, which was last seen back in um, late 2015. And this is um, helped by the strengthening of uh, renminbi as well as the uh, narrowing spreads of, uh, between the CNH high ball and the shy ball. Um, the DBS share of Singapore mortgage loans have also edged higher to 30.8% from 28.7% in June 2017. Finally, we have um, a pleasant surprise. The uh, DBS has announced that yes, it will increase its annual dividend to $1.20 per share, um, an increase uh, of um, doubling from the, the, the payout uh, in 2016, which was $0.60. Cents. So this, um, the one dollar twenty cents would represent about fifty percent uh, dividend payout ratio based on the FY eighteen expected earnings, and um, this represents a dividend yield of four point five percent based on the current share price. Thank you. Uh, next, we move over to the Philip Twenty. Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, Jeremy speaking here. So I'll just briefly go through the monthly performance of the Philip 20 portfolio uh, for the month of January. But before we get there, uh, let's just take a look at the STI brief performance uh, last month and then probably talk a bit more on uh, the recent sell-off that we have seen uh, since two weeks ago. So for STI, we saw quite a smooth sailing month uh, in January. STI was up about 3.85%. Uh, until somewhere two weeks ago in uh, early Feb. So what we saw is ST actually fell about 7.5% off its peak, about 2,600 points to the recent low of where we are right now. So in terms of uh, outlook-wise from the chart perspective for the STI, uh, as you can see over here on the chart, the uptrend, at least the long-term uptrend is still pretty much intact. And what I mean by the long-term uptrend is uh, you can see the STI continues to kind of uh, move along with the series of higher highs and higher lows. Uh, since 2017. So this uptrend structure as of now still stays pretty much intact and even after the recent sell-off of about 7.5%. And the main highlight ex uh, from this particular chart over here right now is uh, to put our attention to this particular line over here at around 3,354 points to 3,341 points. So right now I think STI is sitting on this particular support area uh, which was sort of uh, uh, being formed back around July of 2017. You can see this higher high point uh, come into play again somewhere around November of last year as support and right now you can see that are actually two price action that's popping out around this area so one happened last week and no actually two happened last week and as of now uh, today we actually see a follow through uh, from this bullish rejection which is quite a good sign that there might be some stabilization happening within the STI and in terms of support wise there is one more kind of a last line of defense from the buyers point of view which is this green line uh, which is the 200 day moving average so all in all, in terms of structure-wise for the STI, long-term uptrend remains intact. And right now, STI sits at a very pivotal point at uh, this support area at 3.354 to 3.341 uh, support area as well as the 200-day moving average. So moving forward, what we expect is uh, with the recent flush down in price, uh, we have seen the STI, at least from a momentum perspective, the RSI, which measures momentum, uh, has actually come off its uh, overbought region of 75 to a more normalized range of 30. So with the more kind of oversold, uh, mentality coming back into the market uh, with the RSI being somewhere around 30 
it's actually calling for a reversal back into the uptrend pretty soon. So I think all in all in terms of uh, sentiment wise for the STI, I think we might actually see a reversal back higher uh, into the uptrend and for this next leg back arm, I think we could easily retarget the 3,600 points again. But ultimately I think everything still stems from uh, what happened from the US. So the recent sell-off has uh, mainly come from the volatility spike within the US uh, two weeks ago and ultimately if the US continues to uh, kind of uh, move in a volatile manner then uh, the SDI should continue to move in that, that way. But uh, what we have seen in the price action perspective from the US side, I think last Friday we saw the market kind of stabilize again. So as long as uh, or if the US market continues to move in that manner where it stabilizes, I think the rest of the market including SDI should follow suit. So outlook wise, uh, still pretty bullish even after the recent flush down in price. And I'll just roughly go through the uh, performance for the Philip 20 portfolio. So in Jan, there's only one trade that was being closed, uh, SOG, uh, kind of a hit stop loss at around 14% downside. Uh, uh, in terms of the performance wise, that's all. And then for new entries, uh, we had two new trades, Yang Zijiang as well as Sanding Deo. As of now, not really doing that well due to the sell off that we have seen uh, since two weeks ago. And in aggregate, the monthly performance for the STI to the Philip 20 portfolio. So kind of a lagging the STI for month of Jan. Uh, Philip 20 portfolio was about 2.9% uh, in comparison to the STI of 3.8% gain. And total return wise since inception, uh, since April of last year, again lagging the STI slightly. Uh, Philip 20 portfolio up about 8.2%, the STI are up about 11%. So moving forward in terms of watch list wise, uh, here are some of the counters that we are watching from a technical perspective uh, whereby the uptrends are still pretty much intact. So for all these counters over here, we are watching out to actually re-enter back into the uptrend whenever we see any deep buying opportunities uh, for these counters over here. And last but not least, the snapshot of the portfolio as of last month. So here are the portfolio as of last month, uh, whatever that is within our uh, Philip 20 portfolio. And for those that haven't been following this, uh, this portfolio is uh, plainly uh, being kind of selected based on a technical perspective, uh, nothing fundamental to them. So our methodology is still mainly uh, trend riding and this is a snapshot as of uh, last month. Yeah, and so with that, uh, we've come to the end of uh, today's webinar. Uh, we'll pause right now for Q&A if there is any. Thank you. Okay, um, we, we have a question on any comments for UOB and OCBC uh, results on Wednesday. Uh, quite clearly, um, we are, we are um, expecting a, a strong increase in, in earnings as well, a very strong performance probably in the range of um, net profit is going to probably increase about 15 to 20% <clears throat> in that range, um, driven clearly by the lower provision expense. I mean, we, we, we thought that um, there's going to be some cleanup in the fourth quarter, but uh, taking the read from um, DBS, I think uh, UOB and OCBC are not going to have any surprises on the provision expense line. Um, so what is really working for UOB, I believe it's the SME, uh, SME segment. So in the past, uh, that was actually uh, a weakness for them. But in Singapore, uh, now uh, SME is growing very, very strongly. Then for OCBC, uh, it will be the uh, North China franchise. So Hong Kong is doing very well. So um, we're going to see uh, some very strong numbers coming out from uh, uh, the North China business. Thank you. <coughs>
Hi, this is Richard speaking. Uh, there's this question on Namli. What is the comments on Namli's future prospects? So as we have stated in, in the slide, um, management is more upbeat and they're expecting larger contribution from their core product of the industrial aluminium uh, product, which is the aluminium frame for the refrigerated container. So you can see that uh, revenue grow by almost 30 percent. Let's go, let's go to the slide. Yeah, re revenue grew by almost 30 percent and PADME grew by 26 percent. Uh, so you can expect some um, strength from this segment. Uh, the last bullet point here shows a recovery in US economy is driving uh, the demand for this product. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, we have a question. Um, will UOB and OCBC expect to give good dividends? Okay, um, so the DBS actually announced a, a bonus dividend um, because it was the 50th anniversary. Uh, but I think that's another reason why they gave out the bonus also because in the same time they reduced the CET1 ratio from 13.9% uh, and moving forward after that, uh, uh, they will reduce it to 13%. Uh, percent. Um, so the UOB and OCBC's uh, CET1 ratio is actually higher than 13.9%. Uh, so taking from that read, um, I think they may also try to reduce the CET1 ratio closer to 13%. Um, and that's of course with a good reason uh, because the, 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 there's some clarity on the, on the basal uh, regulation. So um, perhaps we can think uh, along those lines. We perhaps we can we can say uh, there could be a bonus dividend, but whether or not they will permanently increase the ordinary dividends, um, uh, I think it's anybody's guess. Hi, since there are no more questions, uh, we'll end today's webinar here. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you guys again next week.